Welcome back to the Disrupt Education Podcast. Ali is in Italy still. We told everybody you were going to take them on this on this trip. So what's up, Allie? We did. The trip is coming to the end. I, I feel like we have ended up doing way more episodes while I've been in Italy than like anticipated. <laughs> and also, it's still the same day that we, you know, just did a podcast for those, you know, who have been listening to this series. We did one with Ruben Harris. And that was recorded at 1.30 a.m. And this one is now 10.30 p.m. all the same day. So just to set the context, you know, we're just rolling with time zones here. And um, <laughs> But it's great to have another guest and just podcast. You know, it's like deja vu. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. And I'm, I'm very excited about this guest. Um, her name is Denise Lee. And if anybody it knows time zones, it's her as well. Uh, so Denise, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. How you doing? Very good. How are you? Hi, Allie. We're doing great, doing great. So uh, just a brief kind of, uh, I'll give a brief intro of how we met. Um, as a matter of fact, you bounced in and out here and there um, in the business education world. I've seen some of your stuff prior to our meeting, uh, but we met in New York, uh, upstate a little bit. I guess, would you call it upstate? I don't know if White Plains uh, is upstate. Yeah. It's kind of yeah. upper Manhattan-ish. Um, but at the uh, National Business Education Association, there's a symposium and then uh, a uh, planning session. Um, so when I heard you had business-ed.com, I knew you were the real deal. So <laughs> can you give people a, uh, an intro of who you are and, and what you're all about around education? Yes, that is my domain, business-ed.com. Uh, so I've been teaching business education for 27 years um, at a rural school in Pennsylvania. Um, I have taught just about everything under the sun in business ed, from entrepreneurship to accounting, office technologies, computer, um, business, uh, law, marketing, you name it. Like a lot of business teachers, we wear a lot of hats. And uh, most recently, I have I started a store in Teachers Pay Teachers, and uh, that store is Business Ed with Denise Lee. That has become my way of really making an impact and changing business education. So I've become accidentally an educational consultant and <laughs> curriculum writer, um, as I just did a big job for Deloitte, uh, offering three free challenges uh, for accounting teachers to use that's housed on Deloitte's website, which is, of course, one of the big four accounting firms. So um, really excited about that launch. That actually happened while we were in White Plains. So that was exciting. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, it's great to have you here. Allie, you get to shoot out that first question because for those who are seeing, we're definitely going to bring up the city behind her on YouTube if you're watching on YouTube. But All right, more reason to check out YouTube. Okay, so it's I, I love your intro because it really shows um, how many hats educators wear and how multidimensional um, people really are. And, and, and in the educational field, right? So not only have you had this amazing long career and you've taught all these subjects, but now it's like evolving into to all these different consultant stuff through Teachers Pay Teachers. It's like teachers are the most resourceful people. Yes. <laughs> I know. Absolutely. Um, so what I am wondering about, you know, right, you, you met Peter and everything um, at this conference, okay, is how do you see yourself as, you know, it's disrupt education, right? So like, how do you see yourself as kind of like a disruptor in the things that you're doing? You know, whether it's the classroom and this consulting and all the hats that you wear, like how do you try and shake up, you know, the educational space a bit? Five years ago, maybe six years ago, I don't know that I was disrupting anything. I was going through a little bit of an educational, or I would call it a professional depression. I have three older daughters. They always came to school with me. And when the last one graduated, that happened to be the same year that I had to, because the last business teacher, the other business teacher retired, I had to hold up the entire department myself. So I decided it was sink or swim. That felt like a lot of responsibility for me, but I also was competing with so many awesome electives. We are not a certified CTE program here at our high school. So I'm competing with electives that are doing super cool things. So I knew I had to disrupt 
or shake up or make more exciting what I was doing in my classroom. So this was a dream, this city in the background, a dream that I had for many years. I am actually, actually an art teacher. I am certified kindergarten through 12th grade. So um, I am not a second career teacher. I hear so many teachers have had a journey finding their career. I, I know I was born a teacher. <laughs> uh, I was a teacher from the time I was in first grade, but I was an art teacher. So I know the power of a studio classroom where students are creating and um, getting excited about continuing a project that they started, where they're up out of their seats, where they're making a mess, where they're able to be creative and not looking at a screen or a textbook. So this was my vision. I wanted them to be creative. The creative part of me knew the power in that, but I'm also a business geek and got certified to teach business, you know, 27 years ago before they had any praxis tests. I went to school and took all the classes to be the the business teacher that I am. And um, I I wanted them to learn this great rich content that uh, we are providing from the National Business Education Standards. So this is my happy place. And I think, you know, we have such a teacher shortage and I I think we're all going to have to try to find our happy place again in education. My happy place is whenever students are creating, they are uh, the voice in where we're directing our content. We're teaching the content, but they have choice. And uh, so this is my answer. So if that's disrupting, then so be it. Um, But I want them all, I don't ever want to tell them no. You know, if they want to create a business, we talk about it. We counsel. Uh, We have a a council that actually meets to discuss any questions that might happen in our city because we all have a stake here. We're all stakeholders. Now, you know, Allie, this is why I'm like, yeah, this is (laughs) Um, (laughs) it is it is really amazing. And checking out, obviously, uh, and we'll put this in the notes, but you all want to go to business-ed.com because you have some amazing resources um, there. When I heard and saw the classroom. Um, I wish so I'm, I'm in a school. Here's the funny part. Like I'm, I'm not in a rural school. I'm a suburban school, but, um, I don't have my own classroom. Like I'm rolling around and that's what I'm like. Oh my gosh. But, um, one of the things that, uh, I love that, that you're understanding is number one, you were very student centric, like students run with business. Everything's a business, um, as a fellow business teacher and educator, um, we are few and far between, but I think uh, some of the things that we do, um, like Allie does in, in the science classroom, is we, we experiment and we, we put students out there forward. Um, wow. So you're, what I really want to know as well is, is the lens of a, a rural educator, right? Um, I think a lot of the times when we start talking about education and we talk about big systems and big cities, but there are hundreds of thousands of educators who are in rural areas, especially being very uh, affected frontline with a lot of the uh, the teacher shortages and the resource shortages and things like that. What are some of the ways that, uh, you know, you have gotten through that um, and that you're, you're handing that off to give students the best experience that they can and as much of an equitable sense, if you will, um, that you can in a, in a rural population? We are very rural, uh, 208 square miles. We're one of the largest school districts um, in Pennsylvania by square miles. Uh, We graduate about 150 students per year, so we're not that large in uh, student body, but I wouldn't call us small either. It's important to me that I am being equitable, that all students have an opportunity to see the world. Some of our students, and I don't want to make us sound like country bumpkins, because we're not. I mean, we are, we graduate doctors, we graduate teachers, construction workers, contributors to society, great uh, trades, as well as people that have their doctorate. So uh, we are contributors in the world. So I want them to know their world. I have tried to do integrated education where I bring community partners in. And that has always been my jam, reaching out from our community or in our community, which is a very close-knit community and offering opportunities for our students. I've hit some stumbling blocks there because uh, we do have to have, you know, people have to have the 
uh, certifications to work with our kids. They have to have clearances. Um, and also, you know, anyone in our community, they're busy. Entrepreneurs are busy running their businesses and organizations are busy running their organizations. So I do a lot of um, video conferencing with entrepreneurs. Now, next month, actually, in November, we're going to be doing a panel I'm calling the Forum. And I will have four entrepreneurs that are on the panel. The students will come up with the questions for the entrepreneurs. This will be an in-person opportunity for our students to uh, question entrepreneurs because they're all student entrepreneurs. So in between the questions and the answers with our entrepreneurs, my student entrepreneurs will have an opportunity to tell about their business they're creating. Um, they're all um, in the midst of just starting their business plans right now for my business essentials class. My marketing class right now are doing their social media campaigns. My accounting class are actually choosing one of the businesses from the city in which to analyze their um, assets, their liabilities, their owner's equity. So it's when I talk about immersive, it's truly immersive. So I want my students to have an opportunity to speak, work on their communication skills um, in front of the entrepreneurs and share with them what they're learning about business. Um, because I know that those entrepreneurs are stakeholders as well, and they will appreciate seeing um, what my students are doing in the classroom. And just by chance, all four of these entrepreneurs are alumni of our school. So they all graduated from here. I want our students to know that great things are coming for them, that humble beginnings um, often means that you can reach for the sky. Um, like anybody else um, at a big time school district, I like to think we are a big time school district. Um, so that's, those are ways in which I'm trying to bring the community in. Video, bring the community in, bring a city in, uh, so that we actually have an educational tool in my makerspace that we use constantly. When we're talking about decision-making, when we're discussing careers, um, we go through this lab and we look at this city and we can really connect all 16 career clusters. Um, so the opportunity for education in this space is really endless. And I do, Peter, I'm going to make you really jealous because I have a classroom that is a just a, a standard classroom where the things have to be learned. You know, you got to learn the things. And then I have a makerspace where students can apply what they learned and really bring it to life. I love that. And I'm, I'm so glad you don't call it like, so I went to a rural school as well when I grew up and I, you know, I graduated with 97 students. So we are not just country bumpkins, so I love we that. We aren't just country bumpkins. <laughs> yeah, and I actually graduated from this school. Yeah, and, um, you know, I share actually a lot about my business, uh, Business Ed with Denise Lee, with my students, because mm -hmm. I'm a practitioner. You know, I am doing the things. Yeah. And um, I tell the kids, you know, I can teach you all about Facebook marketing till I'm blue in the face, but until you do your own Facebook ad, and you walk through that Facebook campaign, you don't realize um, really uh, <laughs> about Facebook ads until you we, you walk the walk. So much power in a smaller community. Like I thought that I, so I, I worked at a, a semi, I would call it like semi rule. Okay. Right. Like, you know, not, not like, you know, way out um, outside of the St. Louis metro area, but far enough where we covered like 110 square miles and I'm thinking, wow, yours is like double, almost double that. Like, so I, I mean, I remember the busing situation for that and just thinking yeah. that's wild. So I can't actually want to double um, your, your space that you're covering there. But to your point there, we've, we've talked to a lot of people um, in this series uh, and just on the podcast really are from you know, much bigger school districts, much bigger graduating classes. And it can almost be overwhelming with maybe how many community partners or who do you start with and like, where do you fit in? So I think there's like a, a really beautiful part of being rural. And I remember there were different opportunities for students in a school district that, and things could, could almost like happen faster. It wasn't necessarily so monstrative and big that you know you had to go through such a hierarchy right so you maybe have like an efficiency efficiency there um with that even though even though like I know you're saying you know it's like people are busy and, and all this stuff so you're trying to you know work through all of that what I'm interested also in um in what you do in terms of you know you've got this beautiful maker space you've got this classroom is 
tell me your sentiments about testing. And, you know, like, <laughs> what does that look like, you know, for your students? And, you know, like, you know, what have you seen maybe over the years? And, and, and how do you kind of, how do you deal with that with, with your kids, with your students? Okay, so be ready for me to disrupt education. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. I haven't given a test in five years. Okay. I haven't given a test in accounting. I haven't given a test in my computer class. I haven't given a test in... Uh, my entrepreneurship class, my marketing class, students are responsible to learn the content. So I, I, I'm a queen of rubrics. And when I have a project, like they are just starting their business plan, that is their assessment. Every assessment does not need to be a test. Assessments are way, and I give a lot of formative assessments. I say give, I have opportunities for a lot of formative assessment. And a formative assessment can be conversing with a student, uh, talking with a student about what did you learn from this? Uh, what did you learn from that part of this project? Um, so assessment doesn't have to be a test. And I, number one, there's such a stigma with tests. I want all my students to be successful. Um, they could be having an off day on the day of the test. It's so, you, we talk about inequity in education. I also haven't given homework in years. And I don't want to make it sound like everybody is getting an A in my class. They are not. I say, you have to rock star this concept and prove to me you have mastered this in order to get your 20 out of 20 on this SWOT analysis. And I tell them exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, whenever they're breaking down in a SWOT analysis, like for example, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Did they really link the strengths and the weaknesses at the top with our um, internal? And did they link the opportunities and threats with the external? I mean, there's so many components that, that go along with it. As far as accounting goes, they are actually doing the things. They're creating the balance sheets, the income statements. They're assessing a business to tell me what assets, what liabilities, and what owner's equity might this business have. So instead of giving them a vocabulary test where they have to tell me uh, like matching what is an asset, and then they have to match the terms, they are demonstrating mastery by listing the assets and using their critical thinking skills with a, a business that was created by a student entrepreneur in our makerspace. I'm going to ask a follow-up question real quick, because, you know, does the five years fall in line with that, like, shift that you had? Like, what made you decide to just get, get rid of tests? I, know? Hon I honestly had to change it all up. Um, there was so much happening in our school at that time. Um, you know, like I said, I lost my partner in crime, my uh, co-department head. You know, we were departments together, and then it was just me holding up the entire department and teaching new curriculum I had never taught before. So I was just, just the accounting teacher and the business essentials teacher for years. And then when she retired, I picked up all of her preps as well. So I had to look at my, yeah, seven preps, seven classes. So I was changing gears every period. So I knew, because we have 45 minute periods. So I knew I was either going to have to sink or swim, literally, like get out of here or make it work. Um, and when I say there was a professional depression, there really was like my, my babies weren't here anymore. Um, you know, I didn't have them and I, and I didn't have my friend who I worked with and I felt really alone. So this city was my answer to building something that was truly immersive. That was an uh, unbelievably valuable instrument in, as far as a learning tool, because we're creating our own community, we have to collaborate. Um, but I can connect all the things. If you go through our national business education standards, and you go through every single standard, there is a way I can apply it to the city model. So it was my way of really teaching all the things and all the things that were connected and I didn't feel like I was running a three ring circus, to be honest, um, because I, I think that we as teachers have to find our creative genius, our, um, our niche, our jam. And being creative has always been 
my jam. And what I didn't realize was that I had a creative genius that other people didn't have. And when I started sharing my curriculum um, with others, I was realizing that, um, you know, I, I just had so much that I could offer to other people to make an impact in other classrooms really all over the world. Um, and that is something that blows my mind because I can't tell you how alone I was for years. The first 20 years of my career, I didn't know what other accounting teachers were teaching. There was no social media. I'm really dating myself here, but um, we didn't have social media and Facebook groups where we could collaborate together. I wondered, are other people teaching the general journal or the multi-column? I wondered, how far are they getting in a year course in accounting? I didn't have anybody to ask these questions to. Um, now we do, and there's no reason for us to be alone. So, um, you know, that has, that as well in the last five years has kind of happened to, to me. And when I go places, people recognize me and I just can't believe it because I am just Denise Lee in room 112. And um, yeah, they, it's, it's really cool. It's cool to be able to have friends that are in my same zone of genius that I can bounce ideas off with. I think it's very interesting because you you do capture the heart of me because it's the it's the the business educators right um, and many even even where I began uh, this latest journey that I'm at at the high school that I'm at now there were only two of us um, and now we have four I think because uh, there's a lot of opportunity in in business and in pulling down some. Uh, uh, silos, if you will. What's what's awesome is is how you built all your classes to learn with each other. Yes. Um, so going beyond that, and it came out of necessity. I totally get it. I totally empathize with that as a business educator. We're we're, we're solo a lot. Um, we are teaching six seven preps. Um, it is a whirlwind of a day. Um, and to do that was absolutely genius. I think a lot of people talk about it, but not a lot of people do that. So kudos to you, Denise, on that. And and I think now that my next question is, is there is there a possibility or is there a way, or maybe you're already doing this, and I think we chatted about this in New York a little bit, pulling down even further silos into English, math, science, art, you know. I mean, I, I'm going to guess you're doing some art in the classroom, but... Uh, but where do you see that going um, where you where you personalize education for the student? Because, well, there is art and everything. There is business and everything. There is English science and all these things and everything. So where do you see that going? So this is when I say this is an immersive experience for my students. It's also very interdisciplinary. Our engineering students made this bridge behind me and they engineered it just for this city. Our agricultural students created the rooftop garden so that we had some green space in our city. So you'll see some of the buildings behind me have rooftop gardens. Um, so those floral design students created those. Uh, our human anatomy class last year, and they're gonna be doing it again this year, created a hospital. So there is a six story hospital behind me. And that hospital was created by the human anatomy students when they were learning about the systems of the body. So they worked as a group to have the different floors and the different units um, that would be um, connecting the, the systems of the body. Uh, I also have a great fitness center that was created by our fitness students in health class whenever they were learning about um, health and fitness careers. Um, oh my, I can go on and on. Our Spanish students created a Spanish quarter. And that's actually the only church in our city right now, um, but they're going to be creating another church as well. So that's in our Spanish quarter. Our art students did some murals on the side of buildings, and they also created an art center. So we have a cultural district in our city now um, on the other side. My accounting students did food trucks. We took one pound butter containers and I bought little wheels on Amazon. I have had a ball with this, but um, they had to do food truck financials really for a startup business and think critically about what they would need um, as far as assets, what liabilities would they have? And then now they're actually doing the numbers in Excel for those food truck businesses. Um, and then oh, I have to thank we have 12 different departments. Our life skills students were learning about 
transportation, and first responders. So our life skill students created a firehouse, a police station, a bus station, um, so that they can be part of our project as well. So interdisciplinary, yes. Um, it's something that I insist on because I have, it's not realistic for me to believe that every student that takes my classes are interested in going into business after high school. You know, I have one student is he's going to be a chiropractor, period. I mean, he told me that when he was in ninth grade. I've been blessed to have this child all four years, love him to death. Um, but chiropractic care is a big business. And if he's thinking about running his own private practice, then he's going to be an entrepreneur. And so he's taking all the classes that I teach so that he can learn how to run his chiropractic business. And I can't tell him one thing about cracking a back. Um, or anything about chiropractic care, but I can definitely help him when, and he has a chiropractic office actually in our city as well. So he is truly creating a situation um, where he's going to be able to use the business plan he's using in here that he's creating in here uh, for the future. And I love that. Talk about like talking the future into reality. It's amazing. I have two guys that are skateboarders and they love skateboarding. They're everything skateboarding. And they say, we are starting this business. They yeah. have a skate workshop here. Um, they did each their own business in my class, but asked me if they could contribute their collaborative effort. And I say, absolutely. So, um, you know, they bounce ideas off of me and, and we talk about it. And I, I'm so excited to see what's in the future for those guys, because the future is bright for them, for sure. I just love the, the makerspace and it's literally an answer to a question Peter and I have, you know, been asking people and it's, it's just like so visual here. Like you are listening to this podcast that you need to, you need to hit the YouTube link and speak in this classroom because we ask this question all the time is like, how are you connecting academia to reality? Well, you built it. I mean, yeah. and it's literally allowing students to imagine and immerse themselves in a world while they're also applying the content of the class. And I think that, that those components are going to be super memorable for your students and like help them no matter where their journey takes them. I just think that the physicality of, of your maker space is, is incredible. So question for you on, you know, you've been doing this work you had this like just beautiful like I don't know it's like rebirth uh, professionally with, yeah. with um, all of this is if you could you know um even add more to, to not to your plate but to what you're doing and if you could imagine you know uh, a school um that you know, whatever you want to paint it, right? Like, you know, that it, it, it could really benefit students in, in kind of always, you could dream it up. What would it include, you know, and, and what would it look like for students beyond just business, like their whole day, their experience with education, how could we make it better than what, you know, traditionally is happening and kind of, you know, an ev evolution of what you're already doing in your classroom? I would love. Now, this one of these classes that is doing this project is my business essentials class, and it is all year. I would love to be creating this one semester and the second semester, have them do some sort of a um, field experience or an internship in high school. Um, that would be a dream. And because, of course, I, I talked about, you know, restrictions with clearances and, you know, security and all of that. But one thing that I am doing this second semester, and I'm super excited about it, um, these cities are all over the world because so many teachers have reached out, they're in over 40 countries now, using my curriculum called the City Collaborative. So these teachers are constantly reaching out, uh, discussing and sharing. I do webinars with the team of teachers that are creating the City Collaborative um, projects in their own classroom. So we are gonna start collaborating as a unit and our, my students are going to be presenting their business 
to other students all over the world. So we're probably going to be using Flipgrid when doing this. Uh, the short videos, just introduction. This is the business I created. This is what I learned from this experience. These are my key takeaways so that students in Nebraska, in Florida, in Pennsylvania, in Washington are all sharing what they did and showing their pride. Um, that's what I see the City Collaborative community um, wanting. And so I think that that is a great way that we can learn from each other, truly make it an, an immersive and collaborative experience uh, for our kids. And they're so proud of their businesses. They love to share what they did as well. I'm proud of them too. So it's nice to be able to showcase our students. I know the other teachers doing this project um, they're super excited about it as well. Um, after a lot of the bigger school leads hear this podcast, they're gonna be like, "What? What? Wait, what are the rural schools doing?" You know, so it, yeah, you have totally flipped the the script, and I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, I wanted to uh, round out here real quick, Denise. Um, you are at business-ed.com. Where else can people connect with you? And maybe, um, so at the time this coming out, um, maybe uh, early uh, December, uh, where are you going to be and, and where can people find you? I know uh, we're working together at National Business Education Association, but uh, where else can people uh, find you and connect with you? So I'm on Instagram and I'm on Facebook, Business Teach Denise. And I'm also on Teachers Pay Teachers, Business Ed with Denise Lee. Um, I'm doing a lot of keynotes coming up. Um, I know I'm going to be in Kentucky, in Louisville. I just committed to that. I'll be the keynote for their uh, Kentucky Business Education Association Conference in July. I'm super excited about that. And I'm also going to be speaking at the National Business Education Association Conference um, in Kansas City that's coming up in, I believe it's in April, March, April, spring. April, yep. April okay. Um, and I'm doing a couple conferences next month, but that's November and this is coming out in December. So yeah. awesome. yeah. I will see you actually at the <laughs> National Business Education Association because I got a few uh, few workshops over there, too. I can't wait. OK, Al great. Yeah. Allie, final thoughts from Italy. My thoughts here are one, your the length of your career does not determine what you can still create. That's exactly and if right. you can dream it you can build it. And there are other people out there like you, Denise, who are doing that. And they're having this beautiful rebirth. And I just, you're such an inspiration. I'm so glad we had you on this episode. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's also, I don't know if your viewers would be interested, but there is a um, news, CBS News came in and recorded a four minute piece last year. Well, actually it was this year, it was last school year in April. And I don't know if you want to link that in your show notes. Yes, absolutely. Um, we'll get that link and we'll put that in there. Yeah, because my students are actually talking about it in there. So of course they have their clearances in that piece and so forth, um, but you can see their excitement and um, yeah, it's nice to hear them talk about it. Not just me. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I tell students. This is my final thought. My students always tell me and I say, please tell me to shut up. <laughs> and they do. Oh, my gosh. I know. I, I have a student that I, I, he calls me out all the time. Yep. He's like, you need to stop talking. We need to start working. And I don't take offense to it. Me He's neither. exactly right. I said I committed about four years ago to do far less talking and more <laughs> student led instruction, student led learning than ever, because I said I work too hard. And they're like, you do. You yeah, need to just stop absolutely. <laughs> Denise wears so many hats. Denise, thank you again so much for hanging out with us on Disrupt Education. For Allie in Italy, I'm Peter Hostrasser. We'll catch you next time on the podcast. <laughs>